thank you very much for the introduction and thank you guys for being here in this section. So I will skip an introduction. Whoop, we are too far ahead in this presentation. Okay, let me get back to the agenda, back on track. Um, the plan is to basically talk a little bit about indicators of compromise, which is a core component in cybersecurity, and then uh, we will describe our legacy infrastructure, moving on to a more uh, modern approach, and uh, explain why we we should use or leverage uh, probabilistic data structures uh, to do efficient IOC search. Before we start, uh, I would like to know if uh, is anyone here familiar with um, probabilistic data structures. Can you please raise the hand? Okay, that's great. Uh, so I hope in the end you get uh, some nice ideas to improve your own systems. Also, um, another question, uh, very simple. Who is working in the cybersecurity field? Okay, that's the expected result, actually. So let's move on. So we are part of Siemens, more precisely the Cybersecurity Defense Center, and our mission is to monitor and also identify threats. So we want to protect Siemens uh, from cyber criminals. Since Siemens is such a big company and we have more than 500,000 hosts, um, we have a lot of data, therefore we have a panoply of technologies. Uh, we run hybrid uh, architecture, part of the, the systems are on-premises, other parts uh, on the cloud, and we need um, running some of them in the cloud in order to scale uh, for this uh, huge amount of data. But I will go deeper uh, next to it. Cybersecurity nowadays is a huge thing uh, because the cyber criminals are really uh, very sophisticated and also well motivated. So a typical organization will uh, care about these detection vectors, uh, such as uh, endpoint security, and they will run antivirus, for example, uh, networking security with firewall and IDS, and email or proxy solutions from specific vendors with spam filters or DJ detection. These three detection vectors are quite important, but alone they uh, are not enough to keep the organization uh, protected. So it's paramount to combine all of them. And finally, it's also very important to collect uh, information from these different log sources so that you can do post-mortem analysis. And that's the part I want to introduce you, which is IOC search. So, for the ones which are not familiar with cybersecurity, I'm sure you will not understand this, so I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction uh, to this concept. And for that, I'm going to use a simple analogy. Um, since we are in Madrid, um, I decided to bring this uh, TV show. I'm sure this one you know. Uh, who knows the TV show? Of course, most of you. So otherwise, you can look into Netflix. So these guys were very successful in Rob uh, public organization here in Spain, actually in Madrid. Uh, imagine now that you were given a task to protect another public in institution from these same guys, but you don't know if they will attack your institution when you really know nothing, you just know what they have done in the past. So you cannot also go after them, you can only react to some action you need to defend your organization. So you need to have a surveillance system and decide when you will uh, take some action or alert someone in order to escalate some incident, for example, to the public authorities. And that's basically your mission. To do that, you need to look into what they have done in the past and identify these indicators of compromise, which could be someone carrying a red jacket and a mask or uh, wearing already, or carrying ropes and uh, guns. If you see someone inside your facilities with that, or nearby, uh, you can automatically trigger and alert the authorities so they can react in time. That's basically the goal of indicators of compromise. In cybersecurity, it's pretty much the same thing, so it's evidence that your system or network was already compromised. Simple examples hash values of files, such as a PDF or a Word document, domain names, IP address, there are more. 
Another important fact that I want to share with you is that there are thousands of new IOCs per day. Uh, they come from different sources, such as, such as public sources, uh, private intel organizations usually now cooperate in order um, to get more information from different attacks, or our in-house cyber professionals, which sometimes can reverse engineering um, malware samples. This simple example, um, there are a lot of suspicious process, and one of them is actually uh, encoded payload running in the PowerShell. Security professionals can uh, actually decode that. This one is very simple. They just need to use uh, Base64 decoder and run some railroad expressions. There are more uh, examples uh, complicated, which they need to go uh, through many layers of uh, encoding. But this is qu quite simple. And in the end, if you decode, you will get plain text, and you can extract information such as the domains. Why those domains are important? Because you know that the malware will connect to those domains either to extraviate your data or to pull uh, other malware or more capabilities. So what can you do with these indicators? It's quite obvious you want to uh, pay attention to them. Every time you see them again, you want to react. So you can think this as a twofold problem. You need to think in the future and also in the past. If tomorrow I get a new IOC, I want to alert someone, and we run a streaming engine to take care of that. However, this, this talk, we will focus in the, patch, in, in the past. I'm sorry. OK. We will focus in the past. In the past. And for that, you just need to be, to be able to collect and store your historical data, and then just run a simple query and try to find if the same URL or domain is there. Now I'm going to describe how we were doing this in the past in terms of infrastructure and why it was a bad idea and how we involve our infrastructure. Early 2014, we were running three deployments of a massive parallel uh, database uh, from a specific vendor. And this solution was not ideal because um, we could just handle a few days of data. If we try to scale to a couple months, it was really hard and was overwhelming our DevOps because they were investing a lot of engineering time to keep this database only one more day alive. On the other side, our stakeholders, the security analysts, they were not um, very happy in waiting for queries taking hours. So early 2018, we decided to move into the cloud and um, a first step, uh, quite obvious, is to build a data lake. Um, this is super simple. Uh, we decided to go with Amazon, and there is only two technologies that you really need, which is S3 for storage, and then uh, a computation such as the Amazon Athena, so that you can query your data. By deploying this solution in terms of implementation, super easy. No, we no longer have um, operations. We outsource everything to Amazon, basically, because we run these fully managed services and our queries are much faster. We could also store four times more data. But there is one caveat to that. Uh, the computation and uh, the pricing model for this computation scales on demand. So every terabyte of data that you scan, you will pay $5. So if you do many queries, you can uh, go into a problem. And in IOC search, that's actually a problem because if you just receive one IOC, let's say yesterday, and you query your data, let's say your last 90 days, you get, a, you get a result, that's fine. But as I said before, you receive thousands of them. And for each one, you are querying the same exact data for the same exact time range. And this is duplication. You can see already here a pattern or a, a point that you could potentially improve. Worse than that is that um, you expect your queries to return no values at all, meaning that A, your organization is safe, or B, you are doing a bad job uh, with monitoring. Only a few will return values, and you need to uh, take action on that. Doing a quick math to get some intuition of the pricing, 
Uh, for one IOC, 90 days, an av a daily average of half terabyte, you will pay $200. But if you have 100, you, s you will scale linearly to uh, more or less 22K. And if we do the math for the entire year, that's 8 million. Okay, for our big organizations, that's nothing because cybersecurity is one of the first things to worry about and a loss can cause uh, billions of losses, so it's priceless. But still there is, uh, imp uh, there is room for improvement and we decide to move uh, to a third phase which is create specialized layers on top of our data lake to answer these uh, very specific and well-defined use cases. So we know the pattern, maybe we can improve. Naive solutions. On one hand, a naive solution would be to just change the storage system within Amazon, for example, for Redshift. But you are going back again to the same problem of coupling storage and computation. So it, it, it won't be a good idea. And also bear in mind, we have a petabyte uh, data lake. So a petabyte in a uh, data warehouse is extremely expensive. Another naive option is uh, why we don't move to another cloud provider, such as Google. I heard about something like BigQuery. Yeah, those cloud providers are super competitive in terms of pricing. So they do exactly the same as Amazon, Azure the same. So there is no really uh, big gap that you can exploit. And the final naive option is uh, storing uh, this information in a key value storage or, for example, a hash map. But this, since we have thousands um, of IOCs per day, it will scale linearly and you will run out of memory or uh, storage to query these structures. So a better option, and in my opinion, something that suits very well this use case is using probabilistic data structures. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Juan, which will explain you uh, what it is and how you can leverage it. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, probabilistic data structures. But first, let's walk through some notions of big data. So Gartner defines big data with the sentence you see on your screen. And I would like to point out the highlighted words which define big data dimensions. But why do these dimensions matter? Because, because, okay, sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, sorry, why, why do these big data dimensions matter? because they present technical challenges to our big data use cases. There are a lot of par parallel computing frameworks that uh, address these technical challenges. Although, as scalability rises in our problems, these uh, frameworks quiver to meet the big data demands. So, how can we continue improving our knowledge of the data? How can we continue to learn from it? Well, you have, we have to accept a trade-off. We need to lose some data, but continue our, lear our, our learning through uh, time. And this is exactly what probabilistic data structures are to big data. They, are, they provide fuzzy views, fuzzy representations of our data. Let's walk through a little bit these dimensions. First, we have the volume. Uh, volume defines the huge amount of data we generate every day and the volume dimension has problems like membership and counting. Membership is just knowing when an element is in the set, and counting is just counting the um, uh, distinct elements in a set. For membership, we have, for instance, bloom filters, which we will talk later, and for counting, for counting cardinality, we have hyper log log. For variety, variety refers to the different data sources and data types we have in big data. Variety dimension has problems like similarity. So we measure the similarity between two data sets. We have simhash and minhash algorithms for that. And finally, velocity. Uh, velocity uh, refers to uh, how the speed with, with, with which we generate, uh, process, and analyze big data. A velocity dimension has 
problems like frequency and rank. Uh, for frequency, we can use Kanban sketch. Uh, when I say frequency, I mean counting occurrences of elements in a set. Uh, and for instance, we can use QDigest to address rank. With QDigest, we can estimate statistical quantiles for our data and then sort it out. So given this, let's talk about a specific structure, count mean sketch. With count mean sketch, we can efficiently estimate the element frequency in our set. This structure is compressed, comparing, for instance, with other structures, with, for instance, a Python dictionary, uh, for example. Uh, this structure is compressed because it uses ashes to store the values. Uh, a count mean sketch, in a way, is similar to a regular hash table, because they are both two-dimensional arrays, but in the count mean sketch case, we, fi we store sorry, fixed size integers in our entries. Given this, this makes our structure constant in time and space, whilst in hash tables, the, the space complexity is linear, so it grows with the elements we are inserted. So as you can see, Kahneman sketch seems a very promising option to estimate our element frequency. But let's see, let's see how Kahneman sketch works. As I said, we have here a two-dimensional array. And the dimensions of this two-dimensional array control the accuracy of our counts. The number of rows, it's just the number of hash functions we will apply to, to an element to generate hash values to um, map to the columns of this matrix. So the columns are the range of these hash values. So let's see how this works. We apply our hash functions to the, our element and generate hash values, in this case, the hash values. These hash values will map to entries in our matrix, which we will increment in order to insert that element is in our structure. In order to query the, this structure, it's basically the same way. We grab our hash, hash values and map uh, these two entries in the matrix. We retrieve the final value as the minimum of these values, hence the, the name of the structure, which is count mean sketch. Now, let me present to you uh, a little bit of code uh, just to, to show you how easy it is to interact with a count mean sketch. I, I am here creating an object with a certain width and depth. I am inserting uh, this universe of elements, and then I'm checking their counts in the end. Let's see what the Kahneman sketch gives us. And it gives us the correct answer. We have seen four times google.com and two times facebook.com. But now, let me present to you a particular uh, behavior with Kahneman sketch, uh, specifically with near zero uh, frequent elements, so rare elements or non-seen elements. Let's say I'm introducing google.com in our structure, incrementing these entries. Uh, then I will insert facebook.com, incrementing these entries. So the final state of the matrix will look something like this. And now I will query the structure uh, with some domain.com, an element that was never seen before. And if the hash values of this subdomain.com map to these entries, then count mean sketch will say that subdomain.com was seen before when in fact it wasn't. This is a, behav a behavior we do not, do not want for our use case because we need low fuzz positive rates. But this brings us to the no another uh, probabilistic data structure, which is Bloom filter. Bloom filter uh, efficiently estimates membership problems, so efficiently estimates if an element was seen in some set. Uh, whilst count mean sketch was a, uh, a two-dimensional structure, the Bloom filter is just a bit array, whose length and number of hash function define the Bloom filter. So th those parameters control the probabilities of error in the Bloom filter. This makes, uh, as, the, as count mean sketch, uh, the Bloom filter constant in space and time, once again, comparing with a regular hash table. The good thing about the Bloom filters is that you can tune the false positive rate with the number of hash functions, so it's a par that parameter that uh, controls the false positive rate. Furthermore, we have impossible false negatives. 
So if you insert an element in your structure, you set its bits to one, um, if you query again for that element, it's impossible that the structure will say that that element has not been seen. That is impossible. That would be possible if a delete operation was, would be possible, but the delete operations are not possible in Bloom filters, because in order to delete an element, you need to unset its bits, and that might temper the structure, because other elements might map to the same entry, and you are corrupting the Bloom filter. So a delete operation is not possible within Bloom filter. Now, Bloom filter uh, works regularly the same as count means sketch. You have an element, you pass it through your hash functions, and these map to entries in your array. You set those to one. In order to query, the same thing. You uh, grab your hash values, map the entries, and return a bitwise end. So return one if all, val if all values are one, zero, otherwise. Uh, now, uh, uh, the same uh, similar snippet of code uh, regarding Bloom filter. Um, in order to show you again that it's fairly easy to interact with these structures. So I am creating a Bloom filter with a certain capacity and error rate. Uh, the capacity and error rate will derive the dimensions of the array. Uh, I'm inserting this universe of elements, which is google.com and facebook.com. Uh, and you might ask, why am I inserting google.com two times? Well, in the insert operation Bloom filter, uh, we have hidden potency, so if we insert the same element, well, same element twice, we'll have the same outcome. Because we are just, insert, uh, just setting bits, so if we insert google.com, we set its bits to one, and if we insert again, we're just setting the same bits to one, so the outcome will be the same. And in the end, I am querying for google.com and facebook.com that we know that we saw, and some domain, some random domain that was not in, your, in our universe. So the Bloom filter answers this, which is correct according to the universe of elements we saw before. Now that I've introduced, introdu introduced sorry, a little bit the probabilistic data structures, let's talk about how we leverage them to our use case. In terms of hardware, what did we choose and why? Well, we wanted a cost-effective solution. We wanted to save money. So to do this, we committed ourselves to serverless architecture. And when you talk about serverless architecture, cheap compute services in the cloud, especially in AWS, you talk about AWS Lambda Functions. Although Lambda Functions have limited storage, so we need to be careful when designing our probabilistic data structure backend. But let's see the facts of what we learned so far. Uh, Bloom filters can answer with a 100% accuracy if an element was not seen, and can answer with a high probability that an element was seen, in this case, an IOC. The count means sketch can estimate how many times that IOC was seen. Well, why won't we just join these two structures and leverage the best of them to our use case? By doing this, we can even only store one at a time at a Lambda storage device, meaning that we can increase our structures in such a way that we need only one to fit at a time in the Lambda storage device. So given this, let's see how this would work. Let's say I'm asking how many times when was some IOC seen sometime somewhere ago, somewhere some time ago. Well, let's first ask the Bloom filter. And the Bloom filter will state if it was seen with a probability of 99.9%. .9%. If the Bloom filter answers negative, well, there's nothing else to do. We just return, we ha I haven't seen this IOC. But if the answer is positive, well, just ask the count means sketch how many times approximately this IOC was seen. And by having this architecture, we only need one structure at a time in our Lambda function. But now, how can we dimension our structures? We have our backend, but we need dimensions for the Bloom filter and the Kotman sketch. For that, we need to know a little bit about the cardinality of our IOCs. 
And the only ground truth, let's say like that, we have for this, it's our data lake. So in order to correctly estimate the cardinality of our, of our IOCs, let's use our data and query values of cardinality for some representative days. Representative days can be something like uh, days with huge traffic in order to have a bigger upper bound for the cardinality. With these values, we compute the average and the standard deviation. And after that, we leverage a, a property from normal distribution, which is the 68.95.99.7 rule. And you ask, what the hell is that? Well, it's just a rule that states that a, a percentage of values is within a band around the mean. What I mean is, for instance, in the image, you have 68.27% uh, of the values are within the average minus a standard deviation and the average plus a standard deviation. So let's lever this, le leverage this for us and estimate our cardinality, a cardinality to be average plus three times the standard deviation. With this, we cover a huge range of possible cardinality values and we do not saturate our probabilistic data structures. If for some reason this, this value generates uh, probabilistic data structures that might not fit our lambda storage, well, just decrease the factor and we'll still have approximately 95.45%. After that, we just perform a benchmark to see the correct dimensions, to check the correct dimensions for our um, desired accru accuracy. Now, we have our backend, we know how to dimension our structures, now we need to know how to scale them. Our data lake is partitioned by day in order to serve, serve the queries uh, in uh, uh, WS Athena. Since we are uh, representing our data in a fuzzy way, well, let's do the same. Let's partition them by day. And by doing this, we can parallelize operations. We can scale limitlessly because we have a structure each and every day. Uh, the probabilistic data structures do not saturate because each day is a new probabilistic data structure. And if for some reason they might saturate, we can always estimate again the cardinality and the dimensions and adapt. And that from, day, from that day on, the structures will have adapted dimensions to the new IOC cardinality. Now, given the theory and uh, what we used about probabilistic data structures, let's present an architecture uh, a diagram has protocol demands. So we have two phases in our uh, architecture, a query, query phase and update phase. This works like this. The client calls the API, which, is, which was built using API Gateway, and this API Gateway calls an entry point lambda function that will trigger the logic to query to, um, to query the, the probabilistic data structures. All that logic of asking first the Bloom filter and then the count min sketch is within our orchestration service, which is AWS Tab Functions. That is the surface that coordinates the application logic in order to serve the query. If for some reason uh, consulting the, the probabilistic data structures fail, well, then we just fail over to Tina as before for reliability of our application. In the update phase, since we have a fuzzy view of the data, we need to be synchronized with it, at least in time. So as we ingest data, we synchronize our probabilistic data structures with that ingestion using, again, an orchestration service um, with this logic to update the probabilistic data structures. So after this um, presentation of what we um, designed and implemented, let's see what outcome did we have of this. Well, this is, uh, these are metrics regarding um, our service. We have data scan, the cost, and the requests. And uh, we have three months of the yield implementation. We have a migration period and the go live period. And as you see, as we deployed this new implementation, our costs and data scans started to decrease. More precisely, they decreased each 24 times. Furthermore, in order to achieve this cost reduction, reduction, we did not need to limit our service, limit our service requests. We did this without any service downgrade. 
Now, in order to finish the timeline we saw before, uh, we designed a specialized solution to this use case, which is the IOC search using probabilistic data, uh, data structures, uh, which um, resulted in lightning, fa lightning fast queries. So we query in less than a minute petabytes of data. And in terms of overall costs, we reduced nearly 75% our costs, our costs per year. So in overall, we are very happy of the out with the outcome of this um, implementation. So in order to finish, let me show you what did we take away during this journey. Probabilistic data structure fit a wide range of big data use cases because they tackle the technical challenge, the challenges that big data poses. In order to use probabilistic data structures and answer more complex questions, you can assemble uh, probabilistic data structures and target your demands in terms of use cases. That's what we did in ours. And finally, probabilistic stru data structures are space and memory efficient. So to finish, and to the big lesson we took from this, is that if you smart engineer your um, applications, you can save a lot of money in big data and cloud realm. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, we are here for you, please. Yeah, thank you for the for the chat. It was very interesting. Uh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, can you tell us uh, how do you store the PDS in Amazon? Like, in which data structure, like DynamoDB or SQL or something like this? No, we, we store it in the in the Lambda storage device. Oh, so you in, in the, lambda the Lambda itself in the Lambda in itself. The lambda itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There. Nice, cool. T to be more precise, they are on S3 and then you pull uh, into the Lambda container when you want to okay. query them, because you also need to update them, so you need, it, it needs to be available for both cases. OK, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, and just some values in terms of storage. These um, representations, as Ron was saying, these fuzzy representations, they are uh, around um, 200 megabytes. So that's enough to represent a huge cardinality for a specific day or month. So I, I have a final question, Sorry. if I may. <laughs> Anyone with good ideas to implement on uh, your organizations or pet projects, whatever, uh, can you please raise the hand? OK, I see some hands. <laughs> cool, cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.